Let's see you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be here in such distinguished company. Uh, I'd like to introduce my fellow panelists. The great Alessandra Stanley started her career as a correspondent for Time Magazine, went on to work for the New York Times, first as co-chief of the Moscow Bureau, then as Rome Bureau Chief, and finally as chief television critic. Now she's co-editor of Airmail Weekly with Graydon Carter. And not least of all, she is my boss. <laughs> the Swanye man to her left is Ken Oletta, who's written the Annals of Communications column in The New Yorker for four and a half decades, not to mention more books than I'm able to count. His profiles of everyone from Ted Turner to stomach Turner, Harvey Weinstein, are nothing short of epic. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Sean McCreesh, who started working out as, working as Maureen Dad's clerk at the New York Times and now writes features at New York Magazine, where he covers media, politics, and power. And I'm Nathan King. I'm a deputy editor at Airmail Weekly. We're here to talk to you about a world that's fairly insular, but interesting to some, which is the media world. Now's your chance to leave if you want to. <laughs> Alessandra, I'd like to start with you. Uh, how much do you find that public opinion affects your uh, choice of stories in Aramel? You know, a lot less than at the New York Times. And I, it's funny because I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, as I think you all know, the New York Times is the best newspaper in the world, but it's also like a aircraft carrier, it's enormous, 5,000 people work on it. Um, some people are, you know, fighter jet pilots, but not all. And um, it just, it, it, it's very unmaneuverable and it's, it's very hierarchical. And uh, now that Airmail, which is a digital weekly that I do with Graydon Carter, it's more like a PT boat. You know, it's, it's fast, it's fun, and we don't answer to anybody. You know, there's no, Salzburgers, there's nobody sitting there saying you can't say that or you should say that. So, you know, we can run stories that other people don't want to run. Like we did a profile of Barmy Hammer, who lives in disgrace, but um, it was an interesting story. And I don't think the New York Times would have done it. I don't think a lot of publications would have done it. And uh, a, we did a story about Shakespeare and Love that was a little, the moot in the making of the film. And again, nobody wanted to, publishers don't even want to. Uh, publish the book. So there's a lot of flexibility for us that I think a lot of bigger institutions, including the New Yorker, don't have. <laughs> you know, I wonder, as you, as you were talking about that, I mean, we've all been bathed in the News Corp uh, and, and news, Fox News stories about how the, the audience drove what they covered in terms of fraudulent election, et cetera. Do you feel that's true in, in general, say, at the Times, the big aircraft carry, that the audience has too much power? I don't think it's the audience, because we're the audience. I think it's more, it's sort of the politics of, of today, which is the young people and the young people in the newsroom and their objections to objectivity or what, what, all those arguments that you read about all the time. And I think that's what the New York Times is dealing with. Constantly and always trying to, you know, again, like an aircraft carrier, you know, they shift this way and it's incredibly difficult and takes forever, and then they try to shift this way. So, um, so yeah, I think I think it's not the readers; it's it's sort of the cultural, uh, what would you call it? The the culture, the you know, sort of millennial culture that's you. Know, Actually, it's awful. all your fault. Yeah, you're to blame, right. Those awful millennials, yeah. You know, oh, sorry, go ahead, Sean. No, I, I, I disagree with you a little. I think they are much more beholden to their subscriber base than ever before, uh, especially as they move away from an advertiser-independent model, and if you upset the readers, they hear about it. Um, so well, that's why they've moved back. That's yeah. why they've, yeah. Yeah. Because readers, we, um, said, no, that's too much. Yeah. What's so interesting, I feel like older uh, journalists and editors tend to view younger millennial journalists as sort of lazy or unwilling to go out and do gumshoe reporting, but I, I don't know that that's true. What do you think, Sean? <laughs> well, I'm not lazy. Um, I think they have that view for, it, it's complicated and it's almost not the millennials' fault. The media industry has become so hollowed out uh, that for the last several years, many of the jobs that exist for a young person in journalism means being chained to your 
desk in your Brooklyn apartment and having opinions online all day long. But reporting is expensive. It costs money to send a person out into the world and give them a week or two to work on a story and actually knock on doors and pick up the phone and call people. And so now you've got a whole generation of people who have had these really crappy jobs for so long that they never actually learned how to become reporters. They only learned how to have opinions on the internet all day. And it's very corrosive. Can I say one thing about Sean, though? Um, so Sean was a clerk, and it's very hard these days for someone who's a, it's like an assistant um, to get to be a reporter. But during COVID, none of the reporters in Washington were in were home. They were all in Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket. I mean, they were all. Uh, so the only person who was available to go to cover Black Lives Matter or even January 6th was Sean. So he was out there all the time, and did amazing stories that nobody else had, and got hired. Thank you. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was like the country was falling apart. It was like a story buffet, and, and none of the reporters <laughs> were there. So, yeah, sometimes you just have to run into it, and then, yeah, yeah. you get a story. You're, you're the one. <laughs> Ken, there seems to be less room for nuance in journalism now because audiences are so sensitive. Do you think it, that you have to have thicker skin to be a reporter now? Yeah, probably. You also probably have to avoid going on Twitter and some of the social networks and listening to idiots describing your work. Uh, Are you on Twitter? No. <laughs> Sean? I, for, I don't want to be, actually. <laughs> I, I actually think it's destructive to communication. I, I don't, I don't want to waste my time and assume that people want to know what I ate for breakfast. A lot of, a lot of young reporters seem to, uh, to, to really look at it as a reporting tool. I mean, you know, to chase down leads and stuff like that, but it, do you think there's... Yeah, I mean, it can be, I think, true? in breaking news. That was the promise right. of Twitter in the, in the beginning, right? And yeah. the Arab Spring and everything like that. But it has morphed into this kind of, like, fishbowl where everyone's just kind of talking at each other. It's not helpful to take your cues from Twitter. It's addictive, but you have to train your brain that the response you're getting on Twitter is actually not really indicative of, you have to know who your reader is, and, and Twitter is a really tiny, hardcore, you know, and the type of person who tweets like 10 times a day is just a crazy person anyway. <laughs> Years ago when I, was, I profiled Sheryl Sandberg at, at Facebook, and she was number two and, and came in, and she would uh, be in touch with a variety of dozens of friends, and she would upbraid me and say, why aren't you on Facebook? Don't you want to share all your private information with a community of people? I said, no, I don't, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting that you bring up Facebook. I, I find that I get overwhelmed by almost everything. So consuming news is, is kind of strenuous for me. And I, I wonder how you guys organize what you read and how you sift through it all. Do you just go to kind of the legacy publications and, you know, the yes. Times and, yeah. yes. No, I, read, I, I, I get Twitter, but, um, you know, it, I think we all probably read the same things. We read the New Yorker, we read the New York Times, we read, well, now we're re reading the, the Picayune Times. <laughs> um, but, you know, it is useful to get stories from, I mean, it, it, yeah. the Should reason it's so popular is because, you know, it's helpful. Yeah. And Sean, do you think there's anything that millennials are reading that, you know, older generations should be? Or? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they're reading. <laughs> <laughs> what do you read? I read. I'm addicted. I mean, I my apartment looks like a newsstand. I'm constantly just emailing myself pieces and printing them out and putting them aside like I'm going to come back and read it. And I subscribe to a lot of newspapers. The one thing I cannot live without, shamefully so, is the New York Post. Yeah. I get it in print seven days a week. If I haven't read it by lunchtime, I feel totally lost and I don't know what's going on in the city. I'm just completely addicted to it. I love it. The crazier, the better. <laughs> but also, the, I read the Post first thing in the morning. And I read it in part because they have a sports section, which the New York Times has abandoned. Yeah. And unless you want to subscribe to Athlete. athlete. The, the but, New York Times has also abandoned New York City. Yeah. They do not sure. cover New York anymore. And also, the Post gives you a contrary point of view on crime or, or some other issues, which is, which, on the other hand, they, they, if, they, if, if you're a DeSantis, or you're the guy who ran for governor, Republican candidate. I mean, it's just a propaganda sheet for them. Ken, how much has the Post changed since you worked there in the, in the 70s? I worked there before Murdoch. Um, um, I was chief political correspondent for two weeks at, at the New York Post <laughs> in 1974. And um, 
and I had a run in with Dorothy Schiff, who was the owner, and I left. Murdoch acquired the post in 1976, uh, and his friend Clay Felker helped him introduce him to Dorothy Schiff. He said to her that, uh, I'm going to keep it as a liberal newspaper, um, which you saw what has happened to that theory. But then the next year, I was at New York Magazine, The Village Voice then, so it's early 77, and Murdoch and Felker be, had become intimate friends, and Felker described to Murdoch his unhappiness with his board of directors, and Carter Burden, and, and, and Bartle Bull, and a number of other people. And Murdoch then went and did a hostile takeover in New York Magazine, and this to tell you how the culture and, and what is covered in the press has changed, about 40 of us went on strike and to try and prevent Murdoch from succeeding at, at, at acquiring New York Magazine. And it was the front page of the New York Times most days for the week it lasted. And I went to Murdoch's attorney. This is one of the first great lessons for a man in his late 20s. Uh, and I said, Howard Squadron. I said, and I took Richard Reeves with me and Walter Bernard, the art director. And I said, Howard, do you understand if Murdoch succeeds, we're all going to leave. We're going to resign. We're not going to work now. And he said, can he finish? I said, yeah. He said, let me explain something to you. Your furniture, you can be replaced. <laughs> and we all quit, and we were all replaced. Lesson. And then Murdoch sold it and then bought it back later. No, right? he, he sold. No, he, he sold. He kept New York Magazine and The Voice. He didn't dare change the left-wing politics of The Voice. Um, Alex Coburn still wrote his anti-Israel uh, pieces, et cetera. Um, and New York Magazine, there it, it was no reason for him to change it. I mean, he's a businessman. He's, he's, not, he's, not, he's a smart guy. And so he kept it, and then eventually he sold New York and, and, and The Voice but, and didn't buy them back. Sean and Ken, you both report on the media. Do you ever find that your personal relationships get in the way of your reporting at all? Uh, yeah, definitely. Notice how I turn to you. Yeah, people, I'm constantly losing track of who's mad at me. I looked at the festival program. There's somebody here right now who's mad at me. Um, it's, uh, you know, and people are constantly saying things to me now. I meet up with a longtime acquaintance for a drink. Like, we're off the record, right? It's both insulting and amusing. But you, you uh, yeah, I mean, it's an insular world, but you have to draw a line between your real friends and your deal friends. And if somebody's a real friend, you just can't write about them, period. It's just not worth it. You're never gonna be fair, either to the reader or to the person. So you kind of have to know where the line is with some people I just will not write about, period. Before I, I joined the New York Post in 1974, I worked in politics. And I, I worked in Bobby Kennedy's 68 campaign. And I was campaign manager for Governor Howard Samuels in 1974. And with my help, he went from a 20-point lead to a 20-point defeat for governor. <laughs> and and um, so I then went back to journalism and did that. And one of the discoveries that I've made in life, and I actually wrote this piece for the Village Voice back in those days when I was at The Voice, I actually think journalists have to be more ruthless than politicians. Of course, loyalty and friendships don't matter that way. I'm not saying you don't, I agree with you. I wouldn't want to write about someone who was a friend of mine, but I don't have many friends that I would write about that in that world. You keep, I thought you were going to say think, you don't have many friends. So I was going to yeah. say, Ken, no, that's no, not but true. I actually we all feel, know I, I feel we're more, as a journalist, I'm more ruthless than I was a politician. Because I'm not writing to please the person I'm profiling. I'm writing to please the audience and, and to tell them what I think is the truth. And ultimately, you know you're going to hurt someone's feelings and tough shit. <laughs> <laughs> you have to channel that Coney Island yeah, upbringing, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, Sean, on that thread, you uh, just profiled Risa Heller, the New York crisis PR flack, uh, which was an incredible piece. It was an incredible Thank piece. You. She you. knows the media landscape unlike probably any other communications person out there right now. Do you ever feel outmatched by a subject, like they have the leg up on you? Uh, outmatched is an interesting word. Yeah, this woman who I wrote about was a special case because her whole job is to manipulate the media. So it was kind of like we were playing 3D chess the whole time where I was hearing things and I didn't know if I was hearing them because she wanted me to hear them. I was getting totally paranoid. 
But I will say, I guess just in general, and Ken, it would be interesting to hear from you on this because he's the master of the super long profile. He gets to spend a lot of time with the subject. I've done pieces that have been long and I've spent a couple weeks or a few months with somebody and you, you sort of, you're doing this tango, but you, you never really forget that you're doing the dance and that they never forget that you're a reporter and you never forget that you're not their friend. But you, you, you start to wonder if you're only seeing one side of them and if you're being bamboozled or charmed. And I think the only way to cut against that is you have to do all the reporting around them. You have to call their enemies. You have to call the people who report to them. You have to call their employees because people are multifaceted. And if you're only seeing one side, then you are being outmatched. And the only people worth writing about are the multifaceted people. So you just have to make sure you find the other sides and then confront them with it, don't you think? Yeah, I, I also find that, that uh, particularly if you're talking about powerful people and you're profiling them and you're spending months and in the book years, that I always begin by talking about personal questions uh, with them I, in interviews. I, I, I ask about their parents, I ask about their childhood and stuff. And it, be, it creates an intimacy with that person, particularly since you're going to be interviewing them many, many times more. And they, they begin to open up more. And you're not doing that for manipulative reasons. You're really learning something very valuable. But one of the things you also learn as you go along in doing this, you have much more experience at doing an interview like that than they have in doing it. And actually, you, you have more control in some ways than they have. Because you know where you're going. You know what your questions are going to be, and they don't. And they, they want to please you at some point, particularly if they've made the decision to invest right. their time. And it's a fascinating dynamic so that strange, takes place. Yeah. Alessandra, speaking of tough subjects, you were a foreign correspondent in Russia right after the fall of the Soviet Union. Did you ever find yourself in a dangerous situation? <laughs> well, yes. But I mean, there was the war in Chechnya, which was... Um, long time ago, it, was in 90, it started in 94 and it came back in 96. Um, it was dangerous because of the Russians, because, not the Chechens, because the Russian army then had collapsed and you, know, they were, you were either gonna be bombed or there'd be snipers or there were just a, you know, an 18 year old drunk conscript Russian soldier at a century, you know, at a checkpoint who would, you know, wanna fire a weapon or something. So. And I, I say this only because when I look at the coverage of Ukraine and I look at what people are saying about the Russian army, I keep thinking, it's the same bad army I saw, you know, how many years ago? Um, and how can that be? I mean, un under Yeltsin, of course, uh, the whole country had fallen apart, but Putin was all about bringing, you know, the Soviet Union back in its democratic, one, <laughs> democratic form. So it's astonishing to me that, that the military that was so terrible then um, is, is seemingly just as bad now. Yeah, it's really incredible. You started out at a time when women in journalism were something of a, of a novelty. Do you think it prepared you to be a critic and, and a foreign correspondent? Uh, well, I think, I think I was really lucky because I came, I was the generation that came when all these publications like Time Magazine were under a lot of pressure to hire women. Um, and it was, uh, so it was very easy to get a job. Um, it was harder to get people to take you seriously. In fact, most people still don't, but. Um, <laughs> Not, why are you touching me? <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I have one good example, and since Maureen couldn't be here, I'll tell her story, which was at, uh, she had just left Time Magazine to go to the New York Times. Mondale had picked Ferraro to be his vice president. And she told me she wanted to do a story about sort of the optics on stage at the convention of could he touch her, could should he shake her hand, could he kiss her? Because, you know, the first time a woman, and all her editors at the New York Times said, oh, that's so stupid, only you would think of something so sh you know, trivial. And she kept, you know, she persisted. Um, and it was, of course, a great front page story. Of True, people. only she would think of that. Right. <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, first there had to be a policy about kissing. And um, it was a huge success. Every other journalist in the world had to then write that same story. And I was at Time Magazine still. And, 
you know, once again, we said, oops, we got to do Maureen's story. Um, and it changed the cover and everything else. So uh, people started to take her more seriously then as a result of that. And I think we all benefited from that, is that sometimes a, a story that seems like from a f woman's perspective is going to tell you more about the story and get you deeper into it than just the analysis by a, a nameless male. David Sanger. <laughs> <laughs> Alessandra, you had one of like the great fun jobs of all time, which is, or what I think of as fun, the chief television critic at the New York Times. Do you think that streaming has taken the fun out of television? I don't think it's taken the fun out of television. I think it's great now for viewers. I think it's taken the fun out of criticism. Why? Be well, because, you know, back in the day, there wasn't, there was a mass audience, and you were writing for a mass audience, and everybody was watching a certain show, and even if it was an HBO Sopranos, it was still a huge audience. So you weren't just writing about the show, you weren't just sort of advising whether it was worth seeing, it, you were sort of talking about the culture and what this show meant, and you know, if it was on a network show, it was reflected the culture. And now, there's just, too, it's all very niche, so, you know, you're, you, the critics now are like doing a concierge service, you know, where they say, well, if you liked Fauda, you're gonna <laughs> like Tehran. And it's, it's exhausting. I mean, actually, Fauda is great, and so is Tehran, but um, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be doing it now, because it's, you know, it's, it's too hard. It's, too, you're, you're, it's a service now. People don't want to read criticism. They want to know what to watch, and I don't blame them. But she still does in some ways. I, we call her all the time. <laughs> what should I watch? <laughs> Fauda and Tehran. Right. I, I, I think you watch several shows simultaneously, because I don't know how anyone gets through the amount of television that you do. You've seen everything. You know who was, is worse than I am? Oh. David Remnick of The New Yorker. He watches more television. I don't know how he does it. It's astonishing. He, when Fowder of season four came out, just seven months ago, he literally spent the weekend and binged the whole, binged the whole season yeah. four. I don't know how, and he edits a magazine <laughs> and writes pieces. He probably is the most prolific writer in The New Yorker as well as the editor. So it's, it's extraordinary. I don't know how he does it. How do you feel about the streaming age, Ken? Do you think it's taken the fun out of television for viewers or critics? No, I think it's taken the fun out of going to a movie theater. But I wouldn't like to own a movie theater now. But I like streaming, and I like the, I like no advertising. And though it's it's really a death sentence for so many. You see Netflix now agreeing to have ads and and charge you less if you watch if you watch you know through with ads. But I like streaming. What I don't like is how to find out how to find things, and it's so hard. They've never figured out a navigation system, which is your point. Alessandra is your navigation system. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of formerly sane people seem to be publicly losing their marbles, like an Elon Musk. Do any of you have <laughs> a favorite dark horse candidate for next to kind of go off their rocker? What, what, can we talk about Santos? <laughs> I Wait. think he started off wrong. I, I mean, I, I think Trump is, is I mean, I, I think he's lost his, his mind. I mean, if you listen to what he said, I am your avenger. I am the person who is, will bring justice, the justice you want. We will get back at all those people. I mean, and then two months ago, he said we should suspend the Constitution so that it would give him the power to do some of these things. I mean, what's really amazing is that is or so much of his audience thinks this is sane, but it's not sane. It's totally insane. Alessandra, I need. Oh well, the sanctimonious, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what everybody seems to be thinking. Is or I, uh, a lot of people who cover politics are saying that he's he's a very tight wire and apparently very unpleasant to be around, and that at some point he is going pretty soon when he gets tested in a primary he's going to implode and bring, bring his whole state down with him. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he's a lot smarter than Trump. He's, he's obviously oh, a smart guy. Okay. That's not hard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's not a question. Right. Sean, you look like you were going <laughs> to No, I don't, I don't have a good answer to this question. I'm okay. not sure. Really? Yeah, I just don't. I agree. I think DeSantis have this weird feeling he might prove to be a tulip craze. I think once he gets up there before the bright lights, and you can't really... 
you can't really become president if you're only willing to talk to Sean Hannity. I mean, at a certain point, he's going to have to go outside the pack, and I just don't know if he has what it takes. Good question. Sean, the media ecosystem is covered so relentlessly now. Do you find it difficult to find good subjects? Hmm, I, no. I think uh, it feels like everything gets chewed up really quickly and mm -hmm. we're awash in all these headlines. But because the stories are breaking down further and further, I mean, things are just in bullet points at this point, axios. What you realize is that a lot of things, uh, the, they get swarmed and then the pack moves on and there's still a lot left to sort of mine and delve deeper into. And when I first started at New York Magazine, I was worried that I wouldn't have any good story ideas and my editors were gonna fire me and I would be a huge failure. But then I realized that actually, I wish that I could like clone myself because there's like 50 things I wanna write about at all times. I mean, there are so many great characters right now and there are so many things that just get like a just surface level coverage. And sometimes I read about a great murder in the New York Post and I just want to go Truman Capote it. <laughs> but I have three other stories I'm working on. You know, there's, there's so many great things to write about, I think. Can I tell yeah, the story, your story, which is that um, Sean, when he moved to the New York, couldn't afford to live in Brooklyn, where everybody his age lives. And he had to live on the Upper East Side, which is, you know, less expensive now. Um, and, you know, older people, mostly. And you went to the Beach Cafe, which turned out to be a kind of clubhouse for insane Republicans. By the way, all American flags now. Outside. I, I walked by the other day. So but all he American goes there. OK, tell the story about No, it's true. It's like Dante's Dante. Inferno on 2nd Avenue. There's, it's, this, it's like Elaine's for right-wingers only. And I kind of stumbled into it with somebody from the New York Post. And then quickly I realized like the Trump sons are there, and Ann Coulter and Roger Stone, and I was just there the other night, and George Santos was hanging out there. And well, that so was a great piece. Every time that. I'm really desperate for a story, I just swing on by the bar, have a drink, <laughs> and I, I inevitably hear something, and I get a column that week out of it. Who is the owner? It's this crazy guy named Dave Goodside, but it was originally owned by this family that they were like big Clinton donors, and then they became Trumpists, and it, it has some whole crazy backstory. I wrote about it once, but now I can't remember. Tell about Sarah Palin. Well, that was actually up the street at Elio's, but I, I was with my mom there, and she looked up, and she was like, wow, Tina Fey is over there at that table, and I looked up, but it was Sarah Palin, and, and this was the week that she was proudly telling everybody that she was unvaccinated, um, and then it turned out she had COVID, so she was spreading COVID around the restaurant, and it became this huge thing after I tweeted about it, and then two days later, I found out she was back at the restaurant after she knew she had COVID, so I ran over there and crashed her table and begged for an interview. And the, only, the only scoop I got out of it, other than the fact that she had returned to the restaurant, was that she was dating this hockey player, and they had never Former been seen Ranger, in public right. before. Yeah, that Avery. Ron du Duguay or something? Oh, Ron Duque. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the Upper East Side, it's uh, full of riches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, before we go to audience questions, I want to do a quick lightning round, and we can just go down the line. Uh, who do you think is the most sophisticated public figure? Right now? Yeah. I would say Olena Zelensky. I mean, she's amazing. I mean, he's obviously amazing, but she's been going around the world. She was just uh, in Abu Dhabi, I guess. But, um, you know, she's this beautiful, young, sophisticated, she was a TV writer. And she's become this kind of amazing ambassador um, for, for Ukraine, and I just think she's, smart, and the word sophisticated is completely the right one. So I vote for her. I, I mean, he's no longer president of put Obama. I'd have to agree with you. If I put, do you mean like politician? No, no. just to be anyone. It's someone in the public eye. If Maureen were here, she would say Tom Ford, so that's what I'm going to say. The that's designer? Yeah, he's so sophisticated and cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, All right, careful with this one. Guiltiest pleasure. Well, you already know about cigarettes and drinking and <laughs> TV. Oh, I watch Law and Order all the time. Reruns. <laughs> we don't share that guilty pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> What's yours? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of maybe the New York Post. <laughs> <laughs> the Daily Mail, maybe? Cooking is not a guilty pleasure. You're it's a chicken a pleasure. parmesan a connoisseur. Oh, I know yeah, that I am. one. No, but, it, but that's not a guilty pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yeah. 
Who has the best chicken parmesan in New York City? Well, actually, you know, years ago, I profiled a guy by the name of Saad Mousseini in, in Afghanistan, Kabul, and he, he, he started Tolo TV, the biggest, you know, anti-Taliban media company, and many of his, he put women on as anchors, and they, they tried to assassinate, and successfully assassinate some of his reporters. But Saad, I was in, in Kabul for a couple of weeks doing the profile for The New Yorker, and he said, come on, we're gonna go to dinner, and about three nights, we went to this Italian restaurant, not far from his machine gun protected headquarters, and, and he said, they have the best chicken parm you've ever had. <laughs> and, you know, I grew up in an Italian family, and, and it was not the best chicken parm. <laughs> so I, I said to Saad, but I pretended it was, as a rat ran across the floor. <laughs> and I, I said, Saad, when you come to New York, which he, he does, you know, I said, we're going to go to, I'm going to take a chicken parm. So, We've done about 10 restaurants with a group of reporters, Dexter Filkins, George Packer, Saad, Tom Freston, who was on his board. And who? And we didn't invite you. No, we don't allow women to come. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we've gone to about 10, and some are really, really disappointing, including ones you would expect in Little League, et cetera, it'd be really good. The best, Carbone is a veal parmesan. It's really good, it's very expensive. But it comes out, it's about this big, it's for four people. And the Y8 one by myself. And, and then um, the other one that's really good, and really a surprise, the restaurant on Trattoria dell'Arte has a really good farm. And, but people then, I, I was quoted, Maureen did a piece when my book came out, and she asked me, not guilty pleasure, but a question like that. And I, I mentioned chicken parm. And she asked me for my recipe, et cetera. But then she, she, I got all these letters from people and emails, people saying, you have to try the chicken parm at this restaurant <laughs> in Coney Island or whatever. So I have a list now of other places. <laughs> Very nice. Um, least favorite phrase, Sean. Oh, I was just complaining about this the other day. In a lot of news stories, you see the writer says, to be sure, comma. Right. It's kind of like, on the other hand, but nobody says to be sure. I, and it's in every story. It just drives me nuts. <laughs> Once you see it, you can't unsee it. You'll see it everywhere. <laughs> Alessandra? It's a constant battle. Um, I hate the word curated. And everything now in, in, in the world is curated. Um, not, not art, but you know, articles, fashion, everything is curated. So I try to ban it, and, I'm, and, and it keeps creeping back. Of course, it's very useful. Uh, and hard out. Does this, do you know this expression? No. It's a Hollywood term. Sorry. Um, when someone calls you and you're going to talk to someone in Hollywood, and and the assistant says, "Oh, and by the way, he has a hard out at 7:12." Yeah, for the favorite word of publicist. It's just <laughs> awful. Okay, what's yeah. yours? Fantastic. <laughs> Drives me crazy. <laughs> Um, dream Oscars host. I don't watch it, so I don't know. <laughs> Alessandra? So I'm going to watch something, actually. I, I'm kind of curious. But in general, I, my, I, I don't care. Well, I would like to see Chris Rock do it again one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Sean? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Jane Fonda? George Santos? George Santos? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, last one. Book you wish you'd written. Oh, well, that's easy, because I'm reading it right now. Andy Borowitz's book, Profiles in Ignorance. Um, it's so good, and it's just, it's very, very funny, but of course it's all about Sarah Palin and Dan Quayle and Trump and George W., and it's just oh, it's horrible, um, but great. So I wish I'd read that. What about you, Ken? Uh, Walter Isaacson's job, Steve Jobs book. It's a great book. And, and I had tried, uh, I had written Steve Jobs years ago and urging him to cooperate. I knew he was ill long before Walter did his book. And he, of course, never answered my thing. And then Walter, who is a friend, and I had told about this, Walter, before Steve Jobs agreed to cooperate with him, Walter called me up. He said, would you, are you free? I mean, would you feel offended if I did Steve? I said, no, no, he, he won't talk to me, do it. And he did this brilliant book. So I, you know, yeah. which I couldn't have done, by the way. I, Walter's a scientist, too. He knows science in a way I, people like me don't. 
I would say uh, Say Nothing by Patrick Redden Keith. It's, it's a great uh, book. about Northern Ireland, which is where my grandfather was from. So A, those are my people. <laughs> B, it's just, a, it's just a masterpiece of reporting. And it's like, I, I, could, I couldn't put the thing down. It was, it was incredible. Why is that never made into a movie? Such, well, there's so been a cinematic. lot of movies. Yeah. The Crying Game comes to mind, although I guess that yeah. was about something different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll take questions from the audience. We have about 10 minutes, but I just ask you to go up to the microphone over there if you have a question, please. Or, or over there. Thank you. Um, we've got one on this side of the room first, sir. I want to talk about criticism uh, in general. Uh, you're probably aware we have a pretty good newspaper here in town, Times-Picayune. Uh, we have a pretty vibrant you know, literary scene here. And we also have a good uh, magazine, Offbeat, that is sort of our village voice that reviews multiple albums. The newspaper, most papers have let these people go. The newspaper has a full-time food writer, full-time music writer, full-time theater writer. And I don't say theater critic. I don't say music critic. I don't say food critic. Um, it's funny, having moved here from Atlanta and longtime reader of the New York Times and longtime follower of journalism and criticism, there's no criticism here. There's not a bad review of an album here. There's not a bad review of a restaurant here. I'm not, and I'm saying this is, this is okay. This is an okay thing. There's not, the, the music writer does not criticize a concert. When we go to a show here, whatever the artist wants to do, that's their trip, and I'm in for the ride. And it's a different dynamic here. And I just want to know, th there's, there's no criticism here. Why to, is to, that criticism? To say, um, to, like I look at a New York Times opera review, and they just pick and pick and pick and pick. <laughs> and these are people who know what they're doing, and that's their vision. And I wouldn't pick at it the way I used to pick at stuff. Maybe as I get older, I'm getting... It's getting kinder. Yeah. yeah. But, but the problem is, is that you, all these things are, in New York are very expensive. To go to the opera is, uh, is hundreds and hundreds uh -huh. of dollars. Theater, everything. So you do need someone to say, this is worth your time and here's why. Mm -hmm. um, maybe here things are easier, you can... Uh, well, so much of our terms. music is free here. Right, exactly. Right. You, would, you, you don't want to criticize that. <laughs> but, no, but, but I'm coming but for you, free you, and you, you, you allow You only me. for other people, right? You're not doing it to hurt the artist. What you're doing is, by the way, this person, you know, this is not for you. Don't go, it's, it's a warning, you know. I, I'll this also, version of Cats is horrible. <laughs> Don't spend the money. I'll also argue that nothing breeds uh, hatred of your fellow man quite like living in New York City and, and <laughs> <laughs> just that. loathing for everything around you. The other so. thing is that one of the, th one of the reasons we worry about the decline of local press is you don't have book reviews, you don't have television reviews, you don't have reviews of things. And look at what office book tours are like today. You don't go any, I used to, when I first started out, Detroit, Cleveland, all the, you don't do that anymore. And, and so I'm surprised there are, even in the papers you're talking about, they have the critics. Uh, even again, if, though I don't consider them critics, well, the, the way you describe the, the, the restaurant writer will cover 10 restaurants in one article. And he's not going to say, he's not going to kick any of them to the curb. Well, that's, that that, seems, that's being a concierge, yeah. right? Yeah, that's a, it's like a disservice to a reader. I love a nasty, I love a nasty piece of criticism. When, 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 <laughs> when Pete Wells took an ax to per se, that was delicious. It was like a five course meal just reading it. I come out of the Lester Bang school. It's like, I can't, I love a savage review. But anyway, I just want to let you know there's a thoroughly different Live and let live mindset. I, I think there's also a lot of pretension in New York, and I think that it, it takes a certain amount of criticism to knock things down a peg, like a per se or. Yeah. or I'm critical of the nature. critics. I hate half the critics in New York. <laughs> it's what hard to find a good one, like Alessandro. There we go. Thank you. Creme de la creme. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sir? I have a. I want to. Alessandro, I want to extract a promise from you. In airmail, please keep the spirit of spy alive. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Of course. Well, how, how could we not? Because Graydon is exactly. the co was the co creator of Spy and is the co editor and really creator of uh, Airmail. Well, I remember reading about short fingered vulgarian Donald Trump, <laughs> bosomy dirty book writer. Um, 
group of Mary Ambrose and all great stuff, and I just want to see more of that. Well, did we had a whole thing called Magazine, which this was Graydon's idea, which was a parody of what Republican, right-wing, Repu MAGA Republicans would say about Trump and the whole thing. And it was actually really funny. So, very much like Spy, though. Good, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Put down the mic a little bit, Bill. Is there a future for print journalism, newspapers specifically? Is there a future for print journalism, newspapers specifically? Um, it, it, it's not a bright future, and it's not one where investors will be investing a lot of money in newspapers. Um, people go online, advertising declines for them. Um, People get information different ways than newspapers today. So it's not, I, I, I would have, I don't like this, uh, but I, I would put them in the same category I put movie theater owners in before. Is, is there anybody out there like Hunter Thompson these days? Speak a little louder. Is there anybody out there like Hunter Thompson these days? Sean. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, I still think Matt Taibbi has, has the Hunter S. Thompson yeah. bite to him. I think he's, he's an amazing, still, cultural critic. Now he's criticizing the left, but you need somebody to do that. What do you think about uh, print journalism being dead, Sean? You work for print. I don't know. I was walking through the Bronx the other day, and I came across the old printing plant where all the News Corp papers used to come out of, and it's shuttered. And now all the print newspapers in New York City come out of one plant. It's the Times' plant. And, you know, I subscribe to like five different things in print, but because I write about the media, I'm constantly consuming it. But I'm the only person in my office at New York Magazine that reads print newspapers. Um, it's, they're incredibly expensive to produce. I don't think the Sulzbergers and the people running the paper care that much about the print. I heard something really depressing the other day, which is that the team that used to pick the stories on the front page are now going to hand it over to some other team and they're just going to arbitrarily throw things on the front page. It's getting less consideration than ever before. Um, on the other hand, what's interesting about the Sunday New York Times is actually to have that fat, beautiful print product arrive on your doorstep on the weekend. It's almost like a status symbol among the rich. I mean, you're, it's a sophisticated thing to have the paper on your coffee table. So I don't know if they'll live on just as these kind of niche luxury products, but they're very expensive to produce. Well, the other thing is Andy Lack, who, who uh, is, spends a lot of time in Mississippi and, and New Orleans, former chair and head of news at, at NBC, uh, has invested uh, with James Barksdale in, in digital newspapers in, in New Orleans, in Mississippi, and I believe in Arkansas and a couple of other states. And so there is some reason to be optimistic about the investment being made in digital publications. And my understanding, I haven't seen the product, is they do a lot of really good investigative reporting, which is expensive to do. And one of the things that local newspapers are getting out of, and if, if people like Andy Lack's newspaper is doing that, God's work. <laughs> well, don't you think we're going to be pretty soon at a, 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 a place where Newspapers won't have to have big printing presses because people will just print it at home. I don't mean like the way we do now when it's just, you know, but you'll have, surely the technology will evolve, so you'll have a newspaper that looks like a newspaper on newsprint, but it just, you print it out at home. Or you read it on your iPhone. Well, I don't want to read it on my iPhone. Reading things on the phone, you, I think you miss. This generation does. Yeah, I think if you just are on the app, you miss things. I mean, having the physical print newspaper, maybe this is an obvious point, but. Right. Because you're flipping through it, you're forced to look at items that are in other sections and things you would you would otherwise miss. And so everyone's just in their silo more and more. Miss, you have a question? Um, I feel like with the like rise of digital magazines, we've kind of seen a rise of like low quality journalism, thing like BuzzFeed type things that are, you know, like low research, low quality. Do you think that that's eventually gonna get phased out by just kind of like people realizing that's not where demand is? Or do you think because journalism is going to be increasingly digital, that's going to like, it's, that type of journalism is going to stay? That's a very good point. And actually, I, th I think you're right. I think, um, we'll take airmail. Uh, we have the same standards we had at, at, at any magazine. We have fact checkers and copy editors, and, and um, a lot of work goes into it. Um, but I do think that 
sequence all the other serious paper publications um, go more, you know, spend more time on digital. They all have a digital version, but they're not putting in the artwork and the design and all those things. I think it might flush out the, the sort of low level, what is it, the bottom feeders. Yeah, I think the media landscape also got so fragmented there for a while, and as more things start to get bundled and packaged, the second-rate stuff kind of fades into the background a little bit more. I think, yeah, the outrage, clickbait, just kind of crap stuff of the last many years from these websites like BuzzFeed, I think the public's tired of it. I think the publishers now realize that nobody wants that. The question is, does the business model exist to produce the worthy journalism, the worthy writing, the reporting? I don't know. Not many people have figured out how to fund that yet. Yeah. Sir, sure. you'll be our last question. Sure. For uh, when you started Airmail, what's your like uh, biggest surprises, and like what has worked? What have you found that's worked that hasn't worked? And like, what have you taken from starting that uh, digital magazine? Well, what we didn't know, because Graydon and I are not young, um, was that we needed to have social media. So that was a shock. People kept saying, you know, you're going to have to have social media. And we kept saying, what is that, social media? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a surprise. But now we have, you know, Instagram and all those things. Um, the biggest surprise is just, you know, certain stories get read. And even if you have, don't have a huge circulation or you don't have, you know, a huge social media presence, a story like the Army Hammer, um, Profile or this Shakespeare in Love, which was so fun. It was a wonderful. It was a profile. It was it's an excerpt from his book, right? Yeah, but his, nobody wants to publish his I book. Know. You know, that's a whole other thing about <laughs> publishing. But so it's you know, it's just a joy to see when a when a when an article that you love breaks through. So that's the surprise. Well, also, I mean, the the sort of founding like mission statement of Airmail was news at a civilized pace, and the premise was that there is too much and the churn is too hard to keep up with, and it's been really reassuring to find that there is an audience of people who don't need everything, you know, every single day, and they don't need to be bombarded with stuff, and they like reading it on Saturday morning, and that's, you know, it's yes. kind of a beautiful thing. Is this where I'm supposed to say you can get a free subscription? Yes, yeah. <laughs> there, we have a, a snow cone stand uh, just down that way, so if you want no, to go visit, you seriously, if you, you want to get a free, get a free subscription. snow cone. You can get, also get a free subscription to um, Airmail. So there you go. <laughs> all right. That's all. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.